And the call is that we will have a provincial government, a majority government for the progressive conservatives in the province of Ontario tonight. That is the call, a majority government for nation right across the province. Doug Ford has pulled it off, Rosie. Yeah, and if Ontarians obviously want to change, they decided to go with someone that they didn't know. The Ontario Liberals are searching for a new leader after two big losses to Doug Ford's Progressive Conservatives in 2018 and in 2022. One of the people running to replace Stephen Del Duca is Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, who is currently the federal MP for Beaches East York and has a reputation for doing politics a little bit differently. I spoke with Nathaniel Erskine-Smith a couple months back to talk about his leadership race, why he's running, and how he plans to engage young people in the leadership process. Just a quick note, unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties with the interview, so it's only audio for today. Hope you enjoy. You're, you've been an MP since 2015, you were elected, um, and now you've decided to jump into provincial politics. You're running for the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party. Why are you running for the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party? I like to think the better question is how, because for all the reasons I left law for politics 10 years ago that you just asked me about, the real question wasn't why, it was how can you make the biggest difference with the time you've got? And 10 years ago, that was very clear. I was practicing as a commercial litigation lawyer, and the best difference I could make was to help renew our federal politics. We were in third place as a liberal party and in need of renewal. Well, that's where we find ourselves at the provincial level right now. We need that same generational and, and I would argue, gra grassroots local renewal in communities all across this province. And the difference is I now have eight years behind me as a member of parliament where I have a track record of I think being effective in shaping the government's agenda, certainly doing politics differently, taking Trudeau up on that promise of freer votes in the House of Commons, working collaboratively with colleagues across the aisle at times, and a track record of winning elections and building a really strong, inclusive team. And so that core question, how do you make the biggest difference? Find, find me a bigger difference than renewing the Ontario Liberal Party so we can renew our province. How are you engaging young people in your campaign? We have many young people who are day-to-day -day part of everything that we do, and that's an incredibly important part of it. We also have ideas that we're really focused on to serve young people. Housing affordability is squarely, I mean, it's the first thing we've we've released in terms of an ambitious set of detailed ideas around building gentle density everywhere, greater density in your transit, really getting governments out of the way so the market can deliver supply, getting governments back in the game on, on non-market supply and treating housing as a home first and investment second. So it's about ambitious policies. And then I would say, we're, we're gonna, I should add, we're gonna release climate policy shortly. So, you know, keep, keep a lookout for that. I'm hoping it'll be next week. We set out a really ambitious list of climate policies. And the, the last thing to say is about just sort of how we conduct ourselves in politics, that certainly I think young people especially can be turned off by politics of excessive partisanship, politics of talking points over substance. And there are many different ways young people can get involved today in making a difference. It doesn't have to be politics. And we've got to work extra hard to include them, get them involved, make sure their voices are heard, and make sure we're delivering for them. What are some specific ways that young people are getting involved with your campaign? So volunteering, number one. We have every evening, we've got a, a wicked team of young people who join us at the office to make phone calls, to engage people in this process to encourage them to become a member and participate. Uh, the overriding message is if you're frustrated, if you want better, the answer is participation. Young people are involved on our core teams, including our policy teams, including our communications teams, including our tour schedule teams. So th they're a central part of everything that we do. And ultimately, I hope there are many young people who get involved by virtue of voting that there's an opportunity here, as I say, to make your voice heard and make a difference, to help shape the party as we want it to be. The party has been decimated in two elections. That's a struggle, but it's also a massive opportunity. And so if there are young people out there listening, I would say become a member, register to vote for free, and, and participate. Encourage your friends to participate too. How did you get involved in politics for the first time? Was it back in 2013 when you ran for the Liberal nomination? Uh, before that, although less successful, probably. I, I mean, I started out more successful. <laughs> I, I was involved in student politics back in high school, so that's a long time away. 
Uh, I did that for three years from grade 11 to grade 13. I, when I got to Queens, I, I will admit I was a bit burned out. I mostly focused on school and baseball as opposed to practicing any other politics. But I did run for city council. And I thought, you know, here's an opportunity to learn about the political process in a more direct way. I was studying politics at the time, but not learning really how politics in the real world was practiced. And I lost miserably. I, you know, I spent $300 and I got 300 votes and I, I joke I learned everything not to do. And I didn't knock on, you know, I was endorsed by the Queen's Journal, the student paper, I was endorsed by the Whig Standard, the, the general circulation paper, but I, I I didn't knock on enough doors. I didn't engage people where they were at. I, di I, didn't, I didn't build relationships in, in a way. And so when I went to do it again in 2013, uh, that sort of initial lesson was incredibly instructive and helpful. You know, I'd, I'd volunteered on, 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 on some campaigns in between my city council election and, and running the nomination. I'd been involved in my riding association for a little over a year. So, I mean, there's no substitute for just participating, getting involved, show up to meetings. You know, half half the battle is showing up. How do you do that for a whole province, though? Because I know that some MPs that I've talked to, they struggle with getting involved as much as possible within their own ridings. How do you do that for an <laughs> entire province? Well, there are two things you've got to do. You, you do have to make a point of rebuilding an active presence absolutely everywhere. And that's been a mantra of this campaign from the beginning. Whether or not a community has a liberal MPP at Queen's Park, every community should have a strong voice in this party. That's the kind of party we're out to build. And so I've been on the road since October. I was very cognizant that I represent a riding in Toronto and I want to build this everywhere, that I wasn't going to actually do this unless I could build a team of people who represent communities all across this province in every corner. And that's what I really want to emphasize in answer to that question, which is team. Because I'm not going to be able to, on my own, build an active presence everywhere, be on the ground, be involved, I'm working to build relationships in a relentless way, and I will continue to do that. But I, I need to rely on a team and a growing team of all ages to build relationships in their communities and to, to help us really build this successfully and, and rebuild an active presence in places that the Ontario Liberal Party has not had a presence for far too long. It's an interesting uh, strategy that you're sharing because I, I think that many parties focus on, you know, their strongholds and trying to just expand a little bit. Why are you taking a more general approach across the province as opposed to just trying to um, attract those lib traditionally very liberal strongholds? For a few different reasons, but, but one, strongholds change over time. And so, you know, you look back, I'll use Sarnia Lampton as an example, because my wife's from there. And, you know, the farm's been in the family there since 1834. My father-in-law is still there. And Sarnia Lampton used to be a liberal riding. And it, it, now we come in third place. We have given up in some ways. And I think on a micro level, it's the same thing with, you know, I don't know if you've knocked on doors for the Liberal Party anyway, but if you were to knock on doors, some people use a tiered strategy. There are five tiers. And those in tier one are very likely to vote liberal and are you know are worth engaging in a serious way if you if you're short on resources and those in tier five are much less likely to vote liberal or vote at all now okay so if you don't have enough resources and you're time constrained maybe you do focus on tier ones identify get out the vote but if you have the resources and you have the commitment and you got the time knock on every door because someone might not vote liberal unless you're at the door. They might not vote liberal or, or in, vote at all if you, if you don't really engage them where they're at, listen to their concerns, and, and then address their concerns. And maybe they don't vote for you in the first election, but you keep coming back. And, and, and not just at election time, but between elections. That active presence in rebuilding relationships, I think is how we're going to really build a strong party absolutely everywhere. Um, you touched on free votes in your uh, first answer there. Um, if you are successful and you win the Ontario Liberal leadership and you're successful even more and you become the premier, how would you manage a caucus, a free vote caucus? Because I think a lot of the opponents of completely free votes is that you really can't get anything done because everyone wants something different. So how would you approach um, that if you were a premier? I've thought a lot about this and, and to be you know, more complimentary in some ways to, uh, you know, although I've disagreed at times with the Prime Minister and, and the government, I think the Prime Minister in his own leadership thought through this challenge in a really serious way. And I think he strike the balance usefully by saying, 
we're all part of the same team, united by values, united by the promises we make. And so if we make a promise to Canadians or to Ontarians, we keep those promises. You and I might be part of a caucus. We might be knocking on doors. We're, we're unlikely to agree with 100% of the promises in any given platform, but we make a promise we're there to commit to it. So that should be a whipped vote. Similarly, if you are in my caucus and it's a budget matter and the government would fail to continue if we were to lose that vote, we would lose confidence of the House and therefore be thrown into an election. Those those items should be confidence, you know, they, they should be whipped and, and they're, they're confidence matters. If you don't have confidence in the government to vote in that way, then again, you probably ought not to sit in caucus. And so I think, you know, you could add a third that we, we have added a third around charter or human rights issues. You don't want a member of your caucus to vote inconsistent with the charter. Beyond those three lines, there's got to be a lot of freedom to disagree reasonably grounded in ideas, but to disagree nonetheless, and to really push ideas onto the agenda on behalf of one's home community. We need serious people who want to join politics, who are going to want to keep their own voice. I don't think if you want to build a serious team, I don't see a lot of serious people who want to join politics just to read talking points and just to vote how they're told to vote. If you want to really build a serious group of people who are there to represent their home communities, they've got to know they get to keep their voice on behalf of their home communities. Moving on, um, I'm sure that you've read it. There was uh, a piece in the Toronto Star written by Althea Raj uh, a couple months back, back on May 14th. Uh, I want to read you a quote from that piece. Yep. It said, uh, while some of his colleagues, him being you, uh, won't be sad to say goodbye, they complain under the cloak of anonymity that Erskine Smith is an attention seeker who makes life more difficult for caucus. How would you respond to that? I would say our job sometimes is to make it more difficult for the government because we've got to be there to hold the government accountable. And I am fully cognizant that there can be challenges in caucus that, that arise from this because, you know, let's take electoral reform as an example. We break the promise. Is that a comfortable situation for me or for anyone where I'm disagreeing? I write an op-ed to say we shouldn't have broken the promise. There was a better path. And any one of my colleagues in that caucus in that given moment, some might feel very strongly that electoral reform is the wrong idea and they, might not, may, they may not feel so uncomfortable. But there are other colleagues who may think, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have broken the promise, but they weren't as inclined to vote differently. They felt different pressures or they didn't think that a referendum was the right way forward or whatever the case might be disagreeing can put pressure on colleagues because their constituents might say, why aren't you doing the same thing? And so I'm very cognizant of that. I, th I actually think that's the greatest pressure in some ways in any decision that I make. It's less about the pressure that the government exerts and more about you know, how, how am I going to impact my colleagues in the course of this. But at the end of the day, you know, team is defined in different ways. People say, be a team player. Well, my team, as much as it is the Liberal Caucus, is also the Riding Association in Beaches East York. Is, the people who volunteer and knock on doors with me or the people who devote their time and their money to build a team with me here locally. And so I think sometimes we mistake this idea of team as requiring some strict unity in caucus no matter what. I think the best kind of team, we challenge each other. And, and, and really where I would say the emphasis has to be is we challenge people substantively grounded in ideas. And you've got to challenge one another initially in caucus. You've got to challenge one another initially, you know, directly to the minister or the minister's office on different issues if you disagree. And only, I would say, failing that good faith effort to change minds, then I think it's right to take public stands. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I don't think I've cost the liberal government any votes over the years. So, you know, I don't think people should be so worried about it. I think that when people, when I was speaking to some people uh, in anticipation of your interview, they were like, some people were kind of like, oh, well, here's another person that's trying to revitalize our democracy and do everything better and, you know, make everyone involved and reach everyone. We've heard that before. We vote for them. <laughs> and then it just falls apart. What makes yeah. you different? I like to think you could look at my track record over eight years and you could see that I've already acted differently, despite some pressures. And I certainly knocked on doors in 2015 and I said at that time, 
one of the nine pieces that we had in our literature. We had smart, fair, honest government that we were committing to. And under honest government, it was Senate reform, it was electoral reform, and it was democratic reform through de through freer votes. And I would emphasize that to say, I'm, you know, this is my community. I'm going to stand up for you when I get to Ottawa. And I feel very strongly that that bottom-up approach to democracy is how it should be done in Parliament. And I had any number of people at the door say, oh, you, you know, you naive 31-year-old, you, you're going to go there, you're going to do what you're told. I even had, in one televised debate through Rogers, which they don't do anymore, but in one televised debate, I even had my NDP opponent say, you don't know what caucus is like, you don't know how it works. And I like to think that, you know, I've I've done what I said I was going to do. And people in 2019 didn't say the same things to me at the door. They, they saw that I, I conducted myself in a particular way. So, yeah, I would say, look, I, I'm promising to do things differently, but don't take me at my word. Look at what I've done. All right, Nader Skin-Smith, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks. And I'm very glad I ran into you in the House lobby and we are really make this happen. So, yeah, thanks for doing what you're doing. All right, that's it for this episode of Political Debrief. Thank you so much for watching. As always, I would invite you to subscribe down below and follow me on Twitter slash X at Josh underscore Oliverio and on Instagram at threads at Josh Oliverio. As well, I would encourage you to take a look at the audio only version of this episode where we talked about a couple extra things, including why he got into politics and also what advice he would give his younger self. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you in a little bit with another episode.